individuals from participating in politics and indeed from participating in organization and social discussion on the whole. Secular democracies and people who are secular individuals have long been convinced individuals, individuals to think their arguments are not valid and have no place in a secular society. And if we need to change this, we need to signal their willing to have people participate in politics who have religious views. They are willing to accommodate those views, they're willing to accommodate that desire to engage or not engage in certain actions and beliefs that may be required of secular individuals to be willing to carry out. By this motion, what we are doing is sending a signal that we value the contributions of those uh, of religious individuals, we value their participation in democracy, we value their religion as an ideology by which they use to base their argumentation and therefore communicate it to other people within society. I think all these things are valuable and these individuals are ones that should be excluded rather than marginalized. Three arguments. Firstly, on the idea of individual rights and their right to access to religion. Secondly, on the role of religion in society, why it should be more inclusive than exclusive. And thirdly, on the increased awareness of, the, of this kind of uh, of the problem that we have, right? Why should give accommodations, why should signal the importance of these kind of ideologies? Firstly, I have a very extensive model um, clarification hours. So, by electing officials, we mean anyone who's like selected by individuals to a certain position in office, and largely this is a political office, right? You are a congressman, congresswoman, you are an elected official, you are like a mayor, you are a person who is elected by people, probably in pre fair and frequent elections, maybe this is pushing us to talk about like liberal democracies, right? democracy which is largely secular, simply by reasonable accommodation, we think we mean where there's no harm to constituents or someone else can carry out that duty. In fact, that's effective enough. We think there are largely people in politics who can carry out these other duties who are equally trained, who like can be deputized in order to carry out the kind of duty that this person is not allowed to do. We think there's not a high cost of doing this. We already make religious accommodations for individuals, the point at which they do not want to carry out a certain duty in that company. We think that we already make accommodations for them depending on how high the cost is to employers and how like how costly it is to accommodate that desire. I think by religious based uh, religious based objection would be something that comes from any religion whatsoever we're not just in Christians, any religion people have right? anything that's based in their religious ideology or how they interpret that religion, something that's coming from that their reading of those sacred texts. But I think it would be between the events or things that might be uh, forced to participate in. I think those clarifications, uh, opening and closing. Okay. So the point which we're in a small town in Alaska or the rural south where there are only one judge. If that judge refuses to license and give like homosexuals the ability to marry, how would you mediate that within your model? Uh, we think the Alaskan government should then fly in a separate judge from a larger city. We think the point where the government should just buy that plane ticket. It's probably not large city because it's like something from Anchorage to a small town. We think the government should do this at the point which there is no other judge being accommodated. The point is we need a sentence for that court. We are happy to fly in another judge. And the federal budget should be one that is more inclusive and more willing to give out money to be more religiously accommodated. Yep, so. So the, the reasonable accommodation doesn't seem to be, you said that you'd find that in no harm to constituents. It seems like whenever you're not applying the law, you're harming constituents and that they were, they elected you to apply the law. So how is that definition? Okay. Uh, I mean, so someone will be applying this law, we just because it's not that particular here, here. individual, we think someone will apply that law, so it's not as if the law does not exist anymore. Because that particular individual is not applying it, it's not like there's no such thing as justice or application of the law. I think mean, that is quite absurd to think it will happen. Um, I think it's quite reasonable for us to say that duty will be carried out. It's not by that individual. You might have to make that argument as to why you specifically care about that person carrying out that specific duty. And if they're religiously objecting to it, you probably have a bad experience in that situation anyway. Firstly, on the idea of the right to religion, why should an individual actually do this? We think every individual within a society, secular or not, has the right to express any intrinsic uh, part of their identity, right? whether this is based on their ethnicity or whether it is based on their religion. And the point which religion is an essential part of your being, right? It's something that guides your moral code, that structures the kind of interactions you have with other individuals. This is something that's intrinsic to you. It is very hard for people to disassociate their religion from their everyday life. The point which you think is something you do incorrectly might lead to your soul not reaching heaven, and the point which it might lead to something happening to you in the afterlife, you might forsake a happier life for you. I mean, the point which influences your every action is intrinsic to your being and to your character. The point which you can use religion to guide your everyday interaction, the point which you cannot decouple it from who you are as a person because it's an intrinsic part of your identity. So I think while being elected means giving up certain rights, like your private life, details are now in the public sphere, right? Things like that, you give up certain rights to privacy. We, don't think, we do not think it's fair to ask for an elected individual to give up their right to access something such and so intrinsic, such as your, uh, your religious identity. So I think when there is no disproportion of how I think just because a public person might disapprove of your identity and what you choose to do with it in terms of carrying out your religious duties, you should still be able to access it. It's something we accommodate and we allow people to access their kind of religious identity in a way that is more meaningful to them, right? We don't force them to choose between religion and politics. We allow them access to both. Why should we accommodate this right? I think that in societies that are secular, when government allows for religious accommodation, there is a larger inclusion of religious individuals. The point which many people would like to engage in politics, therefore might not do so, because religion is so important to them. This is the point which someone who is Muslim might be afraid of interacting in politics because they might
might be forced to remove their headscarf when they enter certain areas, and that person might, might just choose their religion because it is more important to their life in terms of what happens to them afterwards. So they think this individual person should be included and not disregarded just because of the stat choice they might make because of their religious obligation. But anyway, it doesn't force people to participate in democracy in a way that is secular. It doesn't force them to partake that important part of identity or remove the narrative of slightly religious identity in favor of secularism, which is also a type of identity, uh, a type of narrative and ideology. Does that happen with POI? Okay, okay. Right. At the point where society has decided that they want all of their public officials to appear secular and have voted so so there's no job or the process of being worn in public places, why should we give deference to a single individual as opposed to a society that has already mandated that a certain value set to be applied to their job? I don't think that an entire society has ever been that we want a completely secular, non religious elected official ever, right? We think the point at which we elect people because we like their platforms, we elect people because we like the kind of policies that they're going to push, not because it's their religion, but because we would rather preference the kind of policy platforms they're going to have, rather than like, are they religious enough to carry out their duties, or are they not religious enough to carry out their duties? Applying secularism is just as oppressive as applying religious standards. Here, here. Second argument of the role of religion in society and the solution. When this is learned in the context of liberal democracy, where religion is seen as an inconvenience, what do we change? When we give accommodations, we allow for more, more diverse range of individuals and officials and arguments. The status quo religious arguments are seen as extreme and undemocratic. If you are arguing from a place of religion, you are inherently seen as appealing to a higher authority, one that does not belong in a democracy. Even this is very unfair and very oppressive towards religion, religious individuals who feel that this is a valid form of argumentation. And they, when they don't interact with social discussions, they're, when they're pushed out of the discourse, they, they, they turn to more radical solutions like supporting radical candidates like, like people like the Tea Party and other kinds of ultra religious groups, or they just disengage. Right? Eighty-five percent of evangelical kids are homeschooled. They just don't engage in certain things like the educational system or the political system. They might not vote if certain candidates don't espouse what they want to espouse, certain candidates aren't who they want to be. Why is this a problem? I really think religion is a valid and a valuable basis for belief and argumentation. You can still engage in rational thought, you can still add to conversations, and things they don't necessarily know the truth about, right? No matter if there is a valuable discussion to have about the beginnings of life, we think it's valuable for our religious people contributing to this. What do we do on our side? We increase awareness. By giving accommodation, we signal the importance of religious ideology, religious individuals, not forcing officials to choose between their religious life and their political life. We allow for them to engage in a political discourse and the final discourse we find what is valuable. Please don't forget. is how the government is going to act, 
This is what protection you can expect. That is what the role of a civil servant is to do and ought be to do. Go ahead. Are you talking about individuals just in the executive branch? Because people in the legislature and people in the judiciary are affected as well. Yeah, but okay, so we think this should apply to all officials, right? We think it's particularly harmful when this is done by executive officials in their official aspects. Even if it's done just by a lawmaker who, for example, refuses to accept alternative religious viewpoints in the, in the discussion that he has or in the campaign that he's running, we think it's still extremely harmful because they're preferencing their individual concerns over that of the community as a whole. All right, then. What is the obligation of civil servants? We say that the role of civil servants is to realize law for the people, to ensure that everyone can benefit from what we agree upon as a society is good and desirable. We tell you that there are two unique obligations beneath this. First, the obligation to the law itself, not at this time. We believe that civil servants ought to ensure that the law be applied universally, that it's accessible to all, and that the people's will is truly realized. But additionally, we tell you they have an obligation to the state itself, to represent it above themselves, to act as good and faithful agents, not attempting to undermine that institution which gives them their power, which gives them their ability to act constructively and positively in the public sphere. Similarly, they should preference the rights of their constituents and the concerns of their, of their constituents over themselves and their own personal concerns. Go ahead. All of the U.S. presidents have been religious, but doesn't any way in their belief be expected to civil servants who can represent the people who elected them? No, because they haven't been seeking these types of accommodations that you're looking for, right? We're fine with religious people acting in the best interest of the community. We think that's perfect. That gets the best of both worlds. But we're not talking about that in this debate. What we're concerned about are people like Kim Davis, who use the opportunity for their religion to completely deny all of the obligations that they have under the government they've been elected to, under the government they have worked on. That is the problem in today's debate. We're not concerned with people of religious faith who act moderately and ensure the best concerns of their citizens. We're concerned with people who use their religion as an excuse to undermine the rights of their citizens. Second step, talking about rights. Why is it important that they be universal? We tell you that rights are only rights insofar as they can be equally accessed by all people. Since all citizens contribute equally to government, they ought to receive the same treatment from officials. We tell you that this manifests itself in a variety of ways. We tell you that even if the religious concerns of a local area, for example, prevent easy access to abortions in Alabama, while someone might be able to go across state lines and get abortion, that is still far more difficult for that individual, far more taxing, and places the burden to realize their life upon them as opposed to the government which ought to be preserving it. We think this is extremely harmful because to quote Martin Luther King, justice delayed is justice denied. And we say that any form of justice, any form where you are forced to go somewhere else to realize your right because the local administration in your area doesn't want to grant your right to an abortion or doesn't want to grant your right in any specific area means that that justice is effectively denied. They have been denied their legitimacy by that local government, have to go somewhere else. That is extremely harmful. Rights are only rights insofar as we can access them. There is no, and there is no barrier to their realization. That's what government does. It effectively sets up the potential for these barriers to arise, for one local official to prevent other people from accessing the rights that they have that we have all agreed upon. So what does this mean? What does this look like in the real world? We think there's significant harmful impact that happens. We tell you that there's a loss of faith in government because people don't know whether or not the elect person they elect, they can trust to actually carry out the laws. They have to question whether they have a loyalty to their religion or to their government. Additionally, we tell you that there becomes significant anger towards religious minorities, towards people who are derailing the progress of society, towards people who are preventing them from accessing what they view as fundamental rights. We think this doesn't advance the conversation on religion. We say that it sets it back, sets these groups against each other, and using religion as a scapegoat means that people are far more angry towards religious individuals and don't want to see them in the conversation at all. And finally, we tell you that it incentivizes those officials themselves to push boundaries. You get a thousand more Kim Davises because you legitimize the fact that one person was able to use that as an excuse. We tell you this derailed local and state and federal government across all of the country because now there is an incentive. They have an example to look to, someone who can effectively be a martyr for their cause and encourage further acting out and further behavior. So at the end of the day, we tell you that there are tons of other alternatives for people to engage in their government as a religious individual. You can engage in the national conversation that occurs with the making of laws. You can engage with your fellow people about what you think ought to be law. When it comes to what your citizens and fellow citizens have decided ought to be law, that you have come together and agreed upon ought to be enforced, that you should not stand in the way of that. Because by doing so, you are denying your obligation to your fellow citizens, and furthermore, you are denying their access to justice, denying their ability to access a world in which their rights are fully realized without the barrier of potential government infringing upon them. We are incredibly proud to propose and propose a world in which people are able to access their rights without potential barriers, in which there is no uh, ability for these civil servants to derail the, the tracks of progress for their own personal agenda. We are very proud to oppose.
comments and invite the Deputy Prime Minister to respond. Here, here. does not mean that you are inherently intolerant. Just like being secular doesn't mean that you are inherently tolerant. We think that in a world in which we include multiple parts of the discourse, multiple identities, because religion is an identity. At the point at which you're an adult requesting an accommodation, religion is your identity. It is about as part of who you are as me being black. We think that that is an important thing for people to be able to realize and not have infringed upon. At the point at which Sam comes up here and tells you that we shouldn't infringe on people's rights. He massively undermines his case at the point at which an individual might feel if they take off their headscarf, they are damned to hell. We think that we've infringed upon their right to one, feel comfortable in that space, but two, to realize their religion and realize any value that they should have. Before I go into my own speech, which is extending upon much of Franny's points, which I think were quite smart and not necessarily responded to, um, I have three points of rebuttal. Well, one point of rebuttal, three responses. Okay. When Sam comes up here and talks about the obligation of civil, civil servants, he says that you have a right to uphold the law itself. I think he ignores what Franny says very, very early on in her speech. We have the ability to do things like fly in judges in instances in which someone does not want to comply. What you have to tell us is why that judge has to provide that service. When we could easily find someone else to do that thing, you have to tell us why we would likely traumatize an individual by having to force them to provide some sort of service, some sort of thing that they might not want to do based off of their religion. Then they say, we also prefer a society in which you realize or understand that there are multiple ways in which to access an identity, right? That there are multiple identities outside of secular, right? We prefer a society that provides accommodations, that provides things for people. We think that that doesn't mean that other people can't access their rights, but rather that we have multiple accommodations, multiple understandings. We also think that you are not providing equal access at the point at which you are not allowing people to realize their right to religion. We think at the point at which you believe that you might go to hell if you do something, that you are not providing someone even their access to a bare livelihood, at the point at which I'm petrified that I'm going to go to hell. I don't think that that's great. But also, we think that government can still provide justice and the application of law just by someone else, which is what we are advocating for. We think that civil servants are also people who should access rights. We think that just because you become a civil servant, I'll take you in a second, doesn't, oh sorry, never mind, no thanks. Um, just, because, uh, just because you're a civil servant doesn't mean you check all of your identities at the door. I think that at the point which I feel uncomfortable about something, that I should be able to then say, this is the point at which I opt out, bring someone else in to do this. We think you should have that someone else. We don't think you should then force me to do that. Does that have to be a um, so you're, you're basically saying you're going to pull people from other jurisdictions in. How in the world does that uphold democracy at all? If you're pulling some judge from North Dakota to help execute a law in Alaska. Okay, so I assume there's more than one judge in Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> like, if the point was more than one judge in Alaska, I assume that they know other Alaska laws. We also think that, like, at the point at which we can, like, they, they're, yeah, this is very, it's like we can have the same standard in many, like, many instances. Like, at the point at which you're doing most of the same thing, giving out marriage licenses, whatever. Like, we can provide people to do that. So, what do we bring you about the rights of individuals, why religion is an identity, why we shouldn't infringe upon that identity? We think that elected officials are still people, right? They, even if you are a civil servant, you are still a person, you still have a set of immutable characteristics. Well, we accept that there are times that elected officials still have to act in ways in which 
which they might like move away from what they believe. We think that there are instances in which we should allow for them to have a space to express their religious objections to things. We think that the reason for this is religion's identity, right? By the time you are an old grown adult, someone who's willing to act, request some sort of religious accommodation, we think that you have a deeply ingrained belief that is just as attached to you as any other immutable characteristic. We think at a point at which we also provide things for people, like, like at the point at which you already believe you might want to have your health or something, we think that there's a massive, that you already have a massive immutable characteristic you can't get rid of. We already provide accommodations to people for their immutable characteristics in the status quo. I think mean, it's perfectly fine to say that this is another type of accommodation. But why is religious discourse valuable? How do we have it? Or how do Granny and I increase it? We think there's a massive amount of, there's a narrative that religion is something that is antithetical to democracy. Franny and I do not think that's true because democracy is something that has a plurality of views, has a plurality of understandings of what democracy should be. Who should we think of? Who should we understand? We think that in the status quo, what you do by not having accommodations for people is you remove that multiplicity of views. Why? Because certain people see that there is not accessible to them, right? They see that religion is not accessible to them. Franny talked about and told you that, like, and Sam tries to use against us, it's like there's been a rigid religious resurgence of, like, of super religious candidates. Franny told you that those likely to be one of the harms, right, is people supporting really, really fringe, super, super religious candidates because they believe that they don't have access themselves in the status quo. We think that those are many of the harms of not having people think that they have a religious voice, a religious platform, is they attempt to go as extreme as humanly possible simply to get one or two narratives, one or two voices across. We also think that insofar as you remove the ability for religion to be perceived as something that we can accommodate, right, that we can, like, have in our discourse, which is what you exclude when you refuse to accommodate people, we think that what it does is it harms democracy. One, because people don't want to engage with it, right, at the point at which still, like, evangelical Christians don't want to send their children to school simply because they don't want to engage with the narrative or negative narrative, we think that that's problematic. Right? Because then they don't engage in democracy later on. We think that also you don't engage in democracy when you feel it, it isn't the place for you. We think that what happens very regularly is people start to move away, start to shift. We think that what, what likely ends up happening is you have a less democratic society, a less society that doesn't acknowledge in many parts of democracy that ought to exist, in many places in democracy that we ought to have discussions. For those reasons, Franny and I are so proud of those. Okay, I think the speech of those comments and invite the deputy of the opposition to respond. What secular liberal democracy prides itself on is the ability to maintain personal religious freedom while still maintaining objectivity of law. We believe that objectivity of law ought to be the standard by which law is applied not based upon the tolerance and whims of individuals, not based upon the religious conviction of judges that have been elected and of individuals who are choosing to actively exemplify the law. We think that ultimately, there is an obligation that civil servants must leave and check parts of their identity at the door or must mediate those identities. We are fine with that. We think that that is deeply, deeply important to ensure that all individuals have equal and fair access to the rights that we believe as a society that they deserve. Three points of deconstruction before I get into the obligation of civil servants and the denial of rights. First, uh, ultimately, when they tell you that there's alternatives, right, that we can just fly in judges, first of all, we think that that's a very debate world answer because it's $800 to get from the main city to like the next hub of Bethel. It's incredibly expensive. It's also probably one of the lowest priorities that most governments have, right? Like, oh, you know, a judge didn't like something, therefore we're going to send in another one, right? Assuming that there's like one rogue judge makes a bunch of really bad decisions, right? We think that that's a problem. Um, so we don't think that this is going to be a high priority, right? But we also think that the vast majority of judges are specific to like, a, like individuals have voted them in for a reason, and they exist in a very specific area for a reason, right? Yeah. So the laws in Alaska are vastly different from the laws in, say, North Dakota or even like in a different municipality. We don't think that there is the ability to just like fly in judges and have them understand like the law that opposes that specific 
area. But we think that this is further important because we have to recognize that ultimately, when you choose to continue to fly in judges, you are taking time, you are taking resources. This is akin to the same argument by saying it's fine if abortion clinics in Mississippi close because women can just go somewhere else to get abortion. Women can just cross another state line. They can spend a night in a hotel that they cannot afford in order to get this abortion. We think that that is largely problematic because that creates significant financial barriers. It creates significant time barriers. We think that these are all equally important for the services that judges and clerks provide. Now, of course, the opening government tries to tell us this is just about women wearing jabbas. And I'll get to that when I talk about meeting and identity. That's the only thing that they really want to talk about. But we do think that it is important. Uh, second bit of deconstruction. They try to say that we on side opposition are claiming that religion is antithetical to democracy. That's just objectively not true, particularly in the United States. No candidate is willing to run on a secular platform because they know they won't be elected, right? Atheists were voted least likely to ever be elected any time. We think that that shows that religion does play a massive part. And we also don't buy their analysis when they tell us that evangelical Christians are just going to disassociate from society. Sure, they homeschool their kids, but they also channel tons and tons of money into political campaigns and a bunch of activism. So we think that there are plenty of opportunities for individuals who do have deeply held religious beliefs to still engage in democracy, still engage in the political system, and have their voices heard. We on side opposition would far prefer that that engagement happen at the legislative process, at the activist yeah, yeah. process, in committing and interpreting dialogue that creates law. At the point at which that dialogue has created a law and that society has come to a consensus, or at least a 51% consensus, on what they like or dislike, yeah, yeah. that law then must be objectively applied. So my first point about the obligation of civil servants to the law, first, Jacob. So if you look at our legislatures, they're predominantly like one religion or like one group of individuals. Like how many like Muslims are you seeing in state and national legislatures? If you accommodate for them, then you allow for them to be in those spaces. Right. We aren't sure what this specific kind of accommodation will look like. If you're just talking about wearing jabbas, first of all, we think that that's a very small minority of the population. But what you are doing is opening up the floodgates. Once you have judicial precedent for allowing individuals to abdicate their right with their ability to like manifest the law because of religion, we think that that sets pretty significant judicial precedent. That's that. All right, so we think that ultimately, individuals always have to mediate their identity with the surrounding world. If you as a woman feel as though you're going to go to hell and you aren't wearing a jabbat, we think that that's an valuable and legitimate identity. But we think that at that point, if your society has decided that they want government officials to not wear any symbol of religion on their body when they're in office, that you perhaps may have to mediate your identity and not run for political office or not be involved with that political office. We don't think that that's necessarily the best case scenario, but we think that that is the important balancing of rights, that you are still able to be political and advocate for change, but at the same time, you are not potentially denying society that wants to see a more secular government and a more secular presentation of government. You're denying them the right to have that specific law implemented. We think that that's probably the most tame version and we're still able to defend it on our sense of house. Um, but we ultimately think that it has far more harmful consequences to rights first. So why is setting a standard by which you allow society to shape your religious participation in one that allows people to access certain types of systems? What happens to the judge to just get sick in your in your in your world? Why is it different from allowing them to not do something just because they want to not to take that service? Yeah, I mean, we don't think this is the same as getting sick, right? This is a systematic denial of a specific kind of right that's worth it and being listed. Right? So we do think that there is a mediation of identity, right? If you do have firmly held religious beliefs and can't enter government, then you do have to decide which one is more important to you. People have to make value decisions about their identity all the time. They yeah. always have to mediate the things they believe with the world around them. But ultimately, we believe that there is a fundamental denial of rights. Either you are postponing someone's ability to get married, or you're denying society's ability to see the laws that they want and have set in place to be performed in the way that they want them to be performed. We would far prefer to defer to the side of ensuring that the rights that have been instituted at the state level are not denied by doctors or by like other elected officials, or doctors not elected officials, but it works for the abortion example, are not allowing them to deny elected officials the ability to deny rights okay. in that local area. So at this point at which we have individuals in small rural communities, we don't think there's always that possibility of just flying other individuals out there. That those small niche communities begin to set the laws and begin to change the laws that have previously existed at the state and federal level. We do not want small niche groups to be able to deny rights to other individuals that we have already determined are good and legitimate laws and those rights should not be taken away by specific individuals.
individuals have the right to a religion. They have the right to engage in political dialogue. But at the point at which their religion contradicts their ability to objectively perform the law in the way that society requires them to, we believe that they ought not engage in politics, or that they ought not run for that specific election, that they should mediate those identities, and that ultimately we are going to have a better world that doesn't just allow for the rights of elected individuals who have opted into it, but ultimately creates society that has an objective view of law. We are proud to oppose. <laughs> It is remarkable to me that the opening opposition believes that government should represent the will of its people, yet simultaneously argue that individuals should not have access to individuals in civil government who are not going to, at the best case scenario, represent the specific views they themselves hold and must uphold the will that a majority has passed through a tyrannical set of laws. What we tell you on our side of the house is that reality must dictate that individuals actually do represent the people they claim to represent. And on our side of the house, we get to that better when individuals no longer have to engage in policies that are against their conscience. We're going to give you a specific comparative of what happens absent public accommodation for these elected officials have already happening and why we can fix that problem. But before I engage in that, some specific reputation from what we hear out of opening opposition. Their primary argument is that individuals should have the ability to input into the policy-making process with their religion while it's being crafted as opposed to while it's ongoing. Some problems with this view. Firstly, it means that the individual who's religious is restricted to representing their constituency only on new laws that are made or when they decide to reverse old law. Why is that problematic? In a plural system that they think is beneficial, we think that it's far less likely they'll ever obtain a religious majority or they'll have to campaign on how their religious policies are the ones that they're going to necessarily implement, not just merely having religion as a facet of their identity. Second problem with this is it's biased against those non-religious individuals or biased towards those non-religious individuals who created the policy in the first place, because that majority of individuals who, as we tell you in opening government, and as we hear back in response to opening opposition, have probably existed far more prior to now. We have like far more religious people now. We're now running as a result of being unable to implement the policy. So we already see examples of this argument in practice. What is the comparative we can offer, right? We think a moderate policy is a good one. The ongoing ability to have religious influence in the policymaking process means they're able to consider the context of evolving evol evol issues. No, thank you. What does that mean? It means that Kim Davis can consider herself issuing a licenses to homosexual, like from homosexual marriages, in a manner that is consistent with the Supreme Court rulings that exist as that policy evolves, without having to resort to the religious right having to come up and try to reverse that ruling through policy or create some form of special exemption. That ongoing ability to engage in providing access to rights to individuals where they're going to be provided otherwise, which I'll demonstrate later, does not defer or does not diminish the amount of ability that individuals have to preserve the type of justice that has been granted by the Supreme Court in that case, but does preserve the ability of an individual to not have to go against what they believe to be a fundamental moral truth of their theology. Moreover, though, we think it ensures the ability of religious individuals to get elected in the first place without having to be hardliners. At the point at which you no longer have to run on having to campaign exclusively on how you're going to be a religious candidate who's going to uphold religious values, because that is the only thing that will allow you to reverse the policy they say needs to change or that they, get, they can have influence over, we think it means we get far more moderate religious people in office, and that is particularly beneficial. So the question of how best do we represent the will of the people, back to that central idea, we think we better do it on our side of the house when you can on, engage in the ongoing process of changing policy. Second, on the idea of access to these rights. There's been a lot of confusion about how hard it is to fly people in to rural areas. Like, I think we should fly people in there, right? Even if they don't have the resources allocated, I'm going to tell you and flag it within my constructive material why it is a fundamental necessity in terms of the justice we claim these courts provide for us to fly in these judges, even if we don't provide the public accommodation. Like, I would go so far as to say that if we can identify that they're religious and that might influence the way they decide to make cases, we should probably not have them judge those cases. I'll, oh, I don't want to get too much of my argument. It's really exciting. Don't worry. But in terms of things like abortions, right? Like, people aren't having to go elsewhere for abortions. Like, government's not, they're not providing abortions and things of that nature, right? We're talking about specific enforcement of civil laws. I don't see that example having much meaning in this draft. 
So finally, to resolve the question of who we're actually talking about, I have a couple of case studies I'm going to bring to you in my constructive, but uh, I think a couple of them are, are worth additionally mentioning are the Muslim individuals you'd like to include in policies and the Jewish individuals you'd like to include in your legislature, right? If you can't like have the ability, if you can like if you're forced to meet on Saturday in session to consider policies, well, yeah, that's against your fundamental religious beliefs. You're not going to be able to show up and are excluded from that process. We fix that on our side of the house, and we can say, well, look, we can have these types of opportunities for individuals to engage outside of that. That's a very reasonable accommodation. When you say that you have to pray five times a day and you're missing votes as a result of that, we think on our side of the house we're better able to rectify those types of concerns. But what are the more serious ones? This is the real construction material that I want to bring to you. We think that civil servants in the status quo are not upholding the law because they feel the law does not represent them or their constituency. There is no mechanism, no thank you, for individuals to exercise the fact that they are religious and that they have this sincerely held belief. So Kim Davis refusing to issue licenses is just as much a problem as judges refusing to rule in favor of certain tenets of abortion law when individuals might have access to those services but might otherwise be denied. It's the same thing as school board members dragging their feet on implementing curriculum reform because they include things that they're necessarily opposed to in terms of their religion, i.e. evolution. We think on our side of the house, we need that these policies never get implemented or get implemented in a far worse way as opposed to the will of the executive and the individuals who elected these people do we implement the policies as opposed to uh, like actually like, like provide for in terms of implementation. I'll take that half. All right, weren't these laws established by the majority of the people, the laws that are supposed to be enforced? I, I thought I established early in my speech that the laws were established by a group of individuals who necessarily had to reject their own individual religious compulsion in the process of making those laws. We don't think that is representative of the broad majority of individuals who might be religious, right? The broad majority of individuals who are religious wouldn't say, no, I check my religion at the door when I engage in politics. No, they use that to inform the policies that they make. They use that to inform the process of how they might influence these laws. We think at the point at which you've made them compromise on your side of the house, they're not truly representatives of the religious individuals you're trying to talk about, but they're more so representatives of a version of religion that is advocating and actually implemented in the civil street-level bureaucrats who are implementing the policy we talk about. Those are the school board members who never get touched on your side of the house and who continue to engage in these types of policies and subvert what government mandate is. So what are the outcomes on our side of the house? We think that candidates who are more likely to be moderate are going to run. We think the non-religious no longer become extremely vocal opponents to these types of policies, and we offer more public uh, accommodation more broadly, right? We think that offering public accommodation becomes an electable issue. We think that individuals are going to likely run and say, look, I'm going to run for school board, and I'm going to say that you don't have to teach evolution in your courses if you're a teacher. They're going to run on that platform because as executives, they have the power to offer that discretion to other members of their constituency. If the goal on their side of the house is to be truly representative, we tell you the only way they fix injustice that's already occurring in the status quo is by ensuring that those individuals have an out so they don't have to implement policies they fundamentally disagree with. The biggest impact we have on government is that we change that way that individuals interact with these systems that we believe is oppressive to those individuals who need that justice immediately, as Sam thinks is so important. But moreover, we finally get candidates who are more representative of the broader majority of individuals who are actually religious, who feel that they can't give up their moral compulsions just because they become elected policymakers. Because we believe that religious people should be able to engage without having to give up their beliefs in the policymaking process, we are very proud to propose. All right. I thank the speaker for those comments and invite the member of opposition to respond. Here you Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I'd like to start out how the last line that uh, of opposing government just gave you. He said that we, we believe that religious officials should be able to express their religious beliefs in the policymaking process, and we completely agree. You see, the problem with opposing government's arguments is that they are very unique and only specific to the policymaking process. We have no problem with people actually advocating for their beliefs when they're determining what laws should be in place. The issue is what happens when we're applying those laws. The entire debate is about applying the law. And whenever in this country and in many Western liberal democracies, when you become a, a, an elected official, you take an oath of office. And that oath has something like, do you swear to actually execute the laws? Do you swear to faithfully execute the laws that you were that you were put in place to actually execute? That's the job of an official of an elected official here. And they're completely ignoring that and disregarding that. We agree, religious official religious uh, preferences should be put into the policymaking process, but after that, after society has figured out what laws it's going to take and what courses of actions it's going to take towards specific things, then you can't just say, no, I disagree with that. 
personally, and they result in a number of problems if you do. Uh, we'll give you three, and the rebuttal will be interwoven into these. The first is that you're undermining democracy. You're undermining democracy, and, and essentially you're putting the individual views of a particular person over the people's laws. Essentially you're saying that one particular person, like Ken Davis, can, can contend with an entire Supreme Court decision, can, intend, can contend with the actual law of the particular state. And we think that that's a significant problem. But we don't think uh, that uh, enough examples have been given in relation to this issue. We'd like to give you uh, three other Supreme Court decisions to focus on. The next one is Employment Division versus Smith. In Employment Division versus Smith, Smith was a, a drug enforcement administration official. And he also smoked peyote, which is a drug. And it was part of his religious practice to smoke this particular drug. And Thing. So basically what government, government side would have you believe is that Smith should not have to apply the law to prohibit drugs from, from being ingested by the public based off of his religious beliefs. And the problem with that is that you completely undermine democracy at the expense of the administration of justice, at the expense of government being able to accomplish its particular purposes. Even if it's just for a short period of time, you still don't have the law being applied. And we think that that not only undermines what the people uh, uh, want in that they are actually electing these officials to represent their beliefs and not, not make up one religious preference in their own, but it significantly cuts across compelling governmental interests, Sorry. such as prohibiting people from taking drugs. Second example, Prince versus Massachusetts. In this Supreme Court case, uh, a public official basically did not want to apply child labor laws because the, the uh, children uh, were proselytizing, and they, they, and, and they said that that, ch that child proselytizing and giving religious messages was a, was a beneficial thing, and therefore they didn't want to apply the particular law in that case. The child labor is served. So understand here the extent of what opening gov or, or both sides of government are giving you. The third and final case is uh, Reynolds versus Sims. And in this case, the Supreme Court basically said that uh, Mormons who were public officials still had to apply laws that prohibited polygamy. Understand here that religious preferences can undermine a neutral and generally applicable law to the detriment of society as a whole. And that's unfortunately what the government would have you agree with and, and essentially endorse for a long period of time. Now, the next issue is, that, uh, is in relation to uh, undermining the rule of law. And uh, I, I think that uh, before I go on, I'll take a few. Questions. So the fact, okay. that we're, the fact that we're applying is a reasonable objection. I think that we would have to respond to the principle of access that everyone should have with increasing in discourse based on their different types of ideology. Can you explain to us why they, the largest numbers and money are the only objections you've given us so far from the action side of the so, so the point is that all of those people had a reasonably held, sincerely held religious beliefs in all the cases I cited for you, the, the Drug Enforcement Administration official in Prince versus Massachusetts and Reynolds versus Sims. And they would essentially not being apply, uh, not apply the law and completely undermine the administration of justice. Uh, I think it was John Marshall who said that our government has been emphatically termed a government of laws, not of men. Unfortunately, we'll cease to deserve this high appellation if the government side is voted for in today's round. Now, well, they're basically treating the law as a fluid thing that can be ignored by the whims, the religious whims, of a particular public official. And that's the point here. Now, they somehow say, and it got confusing because I asked a, a point of information about this, that you can pull in a justice from another jurisdiction and that'll actually work. I, I have two responses to this. First of all, understand that this, it, it, this, this could happen, but it would result in a democratic deficit. Essentially, you're pulling in someone who is not elected to represent the views of the people, no matter where they're actually from. My point wasn't just that it's hard to do it, it's that it's democratically incorrect to do it. And then secondly, uh, you're undermining the separation of powers and that you're being uh, pull, pulling other officials from other parts of government to actually fulfill a role that they were never elected to achieve, that constitutionally they never should have the ability to pursue. The next argument is, is uh, and basically the main point of substantive material we want to give you is that in the administration of the, the, the state, the, the administration of the state should be religiously neutral, and you're undermining that with the government side. We think that actually you're going to create and establish uh, the establishment of religion, or are allowed for that, because whenever you allow one particular public uh, official to not apply the law merely based off of his religious preference, then you're going to set up a system in which one religion is preferred to another. An example of this would be uh, zoning ordinances. So a, a public official doesn't chooses to not apply a zoning zoning ordinance merely because he believes uh, that uh, that based so like a mosque, for instance, he his religion teaches him that that Muslims are not necessarily people who should have religious space, and he says that he's not going. 
to apply the law to allow Muslims to get a particular religious establishment, that's allowed for under this particular system here. And, and maybe, maybe he's able to be removed later on, but at, uh, the major point is, is that for a good period of time, I mean, Kim Davis controversy has lasted for months, you're going to be seeing not only democratic deficits, but also the establishment of a particular religion over another. Those Muslim people are not going to have the ability to have any sort of sanctuary for their religious belief. Unfortunately, with the government side, you create a system where public officials can ignore general and neutrally applicable laws based off of their religious whims. And that is courting the anarchy. That significantly undermines the proper administration of justice, and it undermines a government who is supposed to be a government of laws, not of men. For these reasons, we are very proud to oppose this motion. Yeah, gives you a whole bunch of cases that have nothing to do with public accommodation. <laughs> court cases and rulings where you're not flying in individuals to take over in those positions and make sure that the law is administered. He fails to recognize that public accommodation is about separating the individual from the state when they're in that elected position, when they have a conflict of interest. To crystallize this debate, I have two major questions. The first is briefly going to talk about some of the interaction from opening that kind of got dropped in the rest of the debate. And then the second, we'll look at how do we get the best application of the law. Let's look at this first question is of whether or not we get more perspective within the conversation of the creation of laws. This is brought to you out by open government, where they say that individuals are put into places where they don't feel like they have the ability to make or, or enter into the political realm without compromising a part of their identity. If you wear a hijab, you don't feel like you can run for Congress because you have to take that hijab off. And in doing so, you get individuals who are opting out of this system. They say that by correcting for this, that you get this sort of plurality. It's interesting that opposition bench recognizes this. They say that this is a great form of public accommodation for elected officials because it allows for individuals in the policymaking realm to be in a place where they can, uh, they can express their views and before it moves on to the actual existence and application of the law. So they concede to some degree on opposition bench that public accommodation is good for elected officials. They simply object to those at the executive, and I'll get on to that in a little bit. But go ahead. Yeah, so in the status quo, civil servants must mediate their religion with application of the law. Wouldn't your policy increase the number of radicals who refuse to mediate their identity? Sure, and I don't want to call them radicals, right? They're just individuals who have their beliefs and they feel like they have a moral objection to it. But it's not like the law doesn't get applied. Like the only analysis that says it doesn't get applied is when Sarah gets up here and she tells you that, oh no, you can't fly people places. Oh no, it's impossible because of the differences of jurisdiction. A, we will find the money to fly them places. We don't care if we go into more debt to make sure that there's an individual there and who is qualified to do that. If it means that you have to teach a judge the ordinances of Bush, Alaska, so that they can make sure that they go there, sorry, it's just what we call it, um, then we would make sure that that happens, that financial barrier isn't enough to actually deliver the actual justice that exists. This is the uh, material that Matthew brings you. He doesn't care what sort of barriers exist because he tells you that it's a fundamental right that these laws be applied. Okay. So, we think that we get a plurality of, of uh, different perspectives that are existent within the society. We think we get better lawmaking, and this is conceded on opposition bench. So I'm going to move on to where the real crux of today's debate is, and where this comes. How do we get the best application of the law? This is where Matthew's extension is where you need to recognize reality, and unfortunate that the member of opposition doesn't speak to it. What Matthew tells you is that when individuals don't believe in policy, when they don't feel like those policies are right, that they will not apply them properly. So when Kim Davis feels like this is a wrong thing, she says no and pushes back. On our side of the house, you get an individual who is willing to do that job, to fill that space and give that couple a marriage license. On your side of the house, you get these long court cases. Why is this good for everybody involved? What Matthew tells you is when you give the individual the ability to opt out of that opportunity, 
when you tell these elected officials that they no longer have to uphold these uh, perspectives that they don't believe in, and you make it necessary that the law itself will still be uphold, upheld, that you make it better off for everyone involved. Not only do you get the better uh, perspectives within these laws in the first place, where individuals feel like they're empowered within their government positions and their jobs, but additionally, you get the application that is meaningful. No longer do you have school board members who are dragging their feet on policies in terms of implementation because they would disagree with it. They would opt out and say they have a conflict of interest or recognize that, and you get someone else to fill that void. You get someone who's willing to put that policy into place, and you don't have to have that individual suffer from their identity. Go ahead. Why should we continue to value an individual who exists as a civil servant with a duty and obligation to the state to be able to opt out of those duties when it's their fit? Shouldn't they accept their duty in the whole as individuals have elected them to do? And this is the analysis where we really lose, right? Because you say that only certain individuals are available to enter into political office. Only those who can separate themselves from their identities should be able to go into these spaces and interact. But that's wrong. That's, that's pushing away people from the conversation. That's not being tolerant. That's not being inclusive and respectful. Even if you get some form of a delay, even if you get some form of extra cost in the application and the implementation of that law, we would say that it's better to be more respectful for these individuals because their perspectives are important, because we want policies to be implemented effectively, and in doing so, we want to make the world a better place. So let's look at this closing opposition extension. All he does is say that you undermine democracy. Well, no, you don't. You get one individual who wants to undermine democracy and will, in the status quo, you allow them a different place where they don't have to enter into this morally hazardous territory for them. All of these cases, like uh, employment versus Smith and uh, the da -da -da -da, reveals versus Sims and Chris versus Massachusetts, all of these individuals can move away from their positions in that one time where they have a conflict of interest and you can allow for the law to continue existing. Why is this good? Because we don't believe on government side of the house that one individual shapes what that law is. And we reject the analysis from opposition that tries to construe it as such. The state is a general and broad-based abstract instrument. Each individual actor should, for some degree, be able to be implemented and, or taken out of that case if they don't feel like it's acceptable for them. Okay, the one piece of material from closing opposition that might be problematic for us. They tell you that in doing so, in this, in this sort of duty and this separation that you have, individuals would remove themselves and you would have individuals who are not, uh, not elected in positions and in power in the places where an elected individual should be. We would, are willing to fight that harm, right? We think, and first of all, Kim Days of this isn't an elected official, so part of that, but she's responsible under individuals who are elected in the DAs and whatnot. What we would say is that you can get another person to fill that void, and we understand that those elected officials are to some degree to uphold that, but when they fail in their duties, we would fill that void anyway. In the short term, we would say that it's better to appoint someone to make sure that the law is applied successfully and the law is applied universally. We recognize and concede to some fact that some of these barriers are challenging. That economically, sometimes it is hard to make sure that individuals can go out to places that are rural, that don't have very many judges, and make sure that they can adjudicate good claims. But for the sake of justice, it must be done. On our side of the house, we get more perspectives and more individuals, not only in the legislative branch, but in the executive and the judiciary as well. Every elected position allows for this. And this public accommodation is viewed as something that is societally normal. It's something that in doing so, we can get the creation of a better state and the creation of a place where we are more tolerant. For all of these reasons, we are proud to vote. Thank you, speaker, for those comments and invite the opposition to conclude this debate. In the immortal words of Michael Scott from the office, I'm not superstitious, I'm a little stitious. Now I'm going to be honest, I just wanted to open up the office quote. But in that episode, Michael Scott does not, he runs over somebody with a car, but says that it doesn't matter because he didn't run over somebody with a car, a curse ran over somebody with a car. And it completely co-ops his duty as a boss of the office because of his superstition. Now I'm not saying that all religions are superstitions, however I think the principle applies. You undermine civil and democratic government when you allow an individual's religious beliefs to take precedent over the enforcement of the law in a democratic society. And that I think is the fundamental distinction between the opposition and the government side and why you should oppose this motion. 
Now I'm only going to have one point of crystallization because I want to keep this simple. And it's respect for the democratic process and the rule of law. And I'm going to be responding to all of the government's points underneath this. Now it's respect for the democratic process and the rule of law. Now again, both sides have come up here and talked about the importance of religious engagement in the law. And the last opposition government speaker talked about how people just opt out of the system if they feel they're discriminated against. Again, opposition has never said that we don't want religious people included in the process. They're, they can be a part of the lawmaking process. We repeated that over and over. And the example specifically of the hijab. The motion that we've been given talks about the religious accommodation through the enactment of their duties. Wearing the hijab doesn't at all affect your ability to enforce your duties or to carry out your duties as a servant of the state. That doesn't affect it at all. The point is that are we talking about religious accommodations when they're supposed to enforce the law? We have no objections to people being religious and having religious views as they shape laws or take part in the democratic process or even our elected officials. The difference is when it comes to enforcing the law, do we give people religious accommodations? And that's where we draw a huge problem. Now, a major part of the uh, argumentation was that, well, we can just have somebody else do it. They call it, quote, unquote, public accommodation. And I have three responses to this. Now, first, often it's not feasible. Now, in some cases it's feasible, but sometimes it's not feasible. Secondly, it's not democratic. Again, people were elected to a specific position to do a specific job. And if you replace it with somebody else, then you're undermining democracy. And then the third and final response is that the, they agree that the laws must be applied. In principle, they agree at the end of this argumentation that the laws need to be applied. It's the job of the government to, I'll take you at the end of this point, I'll take the back up to the point. <laughs> oh, they agree that the laws need to be applied, and I think that's really uh, critical. Before I talk about a super rich local picture of the audience, right now, religious individuals don't apply laws they disagree with. On our side of the house, we allow people to opt out so that those laws can be applied by someone else instead. How does not that how does that not better support the democratic process in the Again, uh, so, so a couple things. First of all, if their their job is to implement the law, fundamentally that is their job. I've heard to talk that's the oath that they swear to. Their job is to implement the law. Now, if they're going to a position knowing that they're not going to be able to implement the law, maybe that's not the job for them. Second of all, this is a very slippery slope. This undermines the rule of law to allow people an exception that they don't need to follow the law that they would sworn to enforce. If people don't have to enforce the law or follow the law themselves because of religious exemption, do the people that they're supposed to be implementing it on have to follow the laws? What about an individual exemption for those people? I'll take your POI. Does democracy based on representation and protection of rights? Now that's absolutely a misrepresentation of what we're saying. We're saying that religion is a fundamental part of society, and we're saying that religion can, can help shape laws. But once laws are shaped, civil servants have an obligation and a duty to enforce those laws. That's what they swear to do. That's what they're supposed to do. And if you say that they no longer have to enforce those laws, that it's no longer binding on them, it's an incredible slippery slope. For example, the opening government speaker talked about how religious belief is part of their identity, that when somebody sincerely believes something, it's a part of our identity, and we have to respect their views on that. Why if that's the logic is to apply just to religion? What if somebody who has no religious affiliation sincerely, sincerely believes that a law is problematic? Why do they have to follow it as well? And again, why do people have to follow the laws if they don't have to follow the laws themselves? I'll use the example from Employment Division versus Smith. That was a drug enforcement administrator who was the religious exemption that he wanted was he wanted to be able to smoke peyote, even though his job was to make sure that people didn't smoke peyote. It's a slippery slope if we suggest that there is no longer a law, that this is no longer a rule of law, and that an individual's sincere beliefs no longer make that law applicable. We have no problem with religion in the democratic process. We have a problem with when the rule of law is co-opted because of an individual's religious beliefs. Uh, so I'll take a few of back now. Take that example, for instance. In your side of the house, that person just lets individuals who are breaking the law go. On our side of the house, we put someone in there to enforce that law. No, and on, the, on our side of the house, that person wouldn't be in office. That person wouldn't be allowed to be that person. They would have to enforce the law. That's the whole point. On our side of the house, we're saying that that person is supposed to enforce the law or find a job elsewhere. If it's their sincere religious belief, then they shouldn't be in this position. Now, again, they, they talk about how it's part of their identity, that it's important for these people, and public accommodation came up at the end of Colby, opening government speech and the closing government speech. Again, why is this? This is now a concept that transcends religion. We're saying if somebody sincerely believes something, if some, this is a sincere belief of something, that we should accommodate it, that we should accommodate it and just find somebody else to do the job. 
Again, the rule of law and the whole concept of the rule of law is that these are binding laws. Now, Employment Division versus Smith came up with the famous Supreme Court idea of a generally neutrally applicable law. When we're not targeting religion, when we're not trying to be biased towards religion, the government has legitimate interests. The government has legitimate interests in making people that making sure people don't smoke peyote and get high all over the place. They have a le legitimate interest in enforcing laws, and they have a legitimate interest in make sure, making sure that those laws get enforced. And if an individual can co-opt that process by getting out of it, that undermines the rule of law as a concept. Uh, not only does it undermine the rule of law as a concept, but it undermines the demo democratic process. The democratic process is that laws are implemented democratically. Remember, these laws that say that, there, that gay marriage should be allowed, that abortion should be allowed, that drugs should be consumed, were, were democratically elected. These are the laws that the people established. And so the officers, the civil servants who the people put in those positions to implement the laws that the people democratically elected must do the will of the people. That's their job as civil servants. And if you undermine that by allowing an individual's religious beliefs to co-op the rule of law and democracy, you undermine both of those precepts, which undermines the fundamental building blocks of our society and is the reason why you should oppose this motion. Thank you very much.